first of all from Psalm 37 and then in Matthew chapter 5. Psalm 37, reading the first 11 verses. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. You will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil, for the evil doer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at this place, he will not be there, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. And then following on from verse 11, it would read in Matthew 5, these verses before us, Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. We read there that Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then the words that we read in Psalm 37, verse 5 now. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for, uh, for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those when others revile you and persecute you. And utter all kinds of evil against you falsely in my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word. And as we've just been reading in that the Sermon on the Mount, or the part that we read on, of the sermon, uh, we see there how Jesus taught what we might call the, the paradox, the, the apparent contradiction of, the, of a life lived for the glory of God, the poor in spirit, having a kingdom, those who mourn, being comforted. Those who are meek, those who are who are humble, receiving the fullness of, of the earth as, as reward. And it's really this whole aspect of what the true believer is, who is poor in spirit, who, who mourns for his sins, who, who is meek and humble. It's this aspect of what a true believer is that, that we find even here in Psalm 37, the one who waits in the Lord, the one who, the person who delights in the Lord person who's got no, no status that the world reckons to, uh, to, to form success and value, the person who's, who's loved by God and who seeks to honour God, the person who seeks, doesn't seek the world's standards but seeks God's standards. And that, that way of life, that, that conduct, that God-glorifying walk, that God-glorifying walk with God is as we say, it's certainly expressed here in, in Psalm 37. It's this psalm that's given so much direction to the Lord's people over the, over the decades, over the centuries. This psalm that's encouraged the Lord's people, whether we sing it, whether we read it, whether we meditate upon it, it's a psalm that gives a, a God-directed perspective on what's of true value, true worth, what brings true satisfaction in a, in a life lived before God and a life lived for the glory of God. 
this Sam was read just a few nights ago in live TV in America in light of uh, President Trump's uh, rather controversial uh, holding of the Bible outside an Episcopal church. And a few days later on the program, the, the, the live show that James Corden, the actor, presents, James Corden's father, a Christian, a Christian bookseller, read from the psalm. In fact, he read uh, from verse 3 to verse 7. He spoke of how the psalm, one of his favorite psalms, and how encouraged he is by the words that we ourselves read this evening. And so we're going to consider certainly part of the psalm, a psalm that gives so much encouragement to the Lord's people. And as we read these first 11 verses, we see that God gives a series of commands. God in his love is giving commands, commands for the well-being of our souls, commands that call us to a steadfast, consistent obedience to God in the way that we live, in the way that we conduct ourselves before God. It's a life lived in relation to God, and a life that's lived in relation to God, whose, whose kindness to us is such. He gives us these, these commands to follow. These commands, we might say, that really are, are in relation to the Ten Commandments, how we love God and how we love uh, one another, how we love our neighbor. And you see, there's a, a whole series of commands that God gives in this psalm. I've counted 12 separate uh, commands not to fret over evildoers, to trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. We'll be considering that particular command uh, later to delight ourselves in the Lord, the command to commit your way to the Lord. And again, to trust in him. The command to, to be still before the Lord and the command to wait patiently for him. And again, repeated the command to, to don't fret over, over those who prosper in their ways, over someone who, who succeeds by his evil devices. And then the command to refrain from anger. To first, and again, repeated again, not to, first, to fret ourselves. Because as the psalm writer tells us, David tells us, it only leads to evil. Well, separate commands that really add up to a life that's lived well in the midst of an evil world. Now, this original, this psalm in the original language is actually what we call an acrostic psalm, the ABC, if you like. Each double verse it begins with a new letter of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. I suppose a way to, to memorize the psalm. Uh, we have the psalm before us, not in a, an English acrostic sense, but certainly the psalm that gives so much teaching how we live before God and before others. But then you might think, well, this psalm, Psalm 37, um, if it's in a, an ABC format, as it were, then uh, if there's a priority in, in how we live our lives, you might think, well, why is it that the psalmist begins with this command not to fret ourselves over evildoers? Why is this taking us a priority? Well, surely the answer lies in the very fact of who we worship. I mean, the first commandment that God gave to the Israelites through Moses, remember the first commandment uh, was, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, here in this, this psalm, the psalmist given direction we're to live before God, not to fret ourselves over, over evil doers, really not to, to be so concerned, not to be so envious of a lifestyle that makes self God rather than worshipping the one true God. And so it's not for the Lord's people to, to upset ourselves where, you know, when we see success in a carefree life, when that life is so contrary to to God's word and God's law. It's not for us to envy those who make an idol of, of self, an idol of riches, an idol of well, self-righteous contempt for the one true God. Because life in all its fullness, life that truly satisfies, doesn't consist in our possessions or in our riches or in our status symbols. Life its fullness isn't about glorifying self. Life in all its fullness consists 
in glorifying God and following the Savior, the Lord Jesus. Life lived to God's glory is a life learning process, life learning in being content in every circumstance. We noticed that a few weeks ago when we were considering Paul's words when he spoke of his learning to be content in every circumstance. And so it's, it's really the height of foolishness to think that life in all its fullness is enjoyed by those whom the psalmist calls evildoers, whose God, in fact, is themselves. And yet there's that temptation, that temptation for, for believers to, to envy the wicked, to envy a lifestyle that's so contrary to, to what God sets as the standard for holiness and godliness. It, there is a temptation to be jealous of the, the seeming freedoms of, of, of those whose cares and, and troubles seem to be absent when, when we see the, the suffering that the Lord's people endure. The psalmist of Psalm 73, he had that, that particular attitude at first. At first, he, he was so envious of those who, whose life seemed so carefree and trouble-free and like himself, and he, he grumbled about his own trials and sufferings. That psalm writer later acknowledged that his initial thinking was so wrong. The fact is, is there, believers, we can have that, that tendency, that temptation, to look longingly, even enviously, at those who have no love for, for God, and yet those who seem to enjoy the good things of life. You see, that, that yielding to that kind of temptation really is a dissatisfaction with the blessings that God gives you in his, in his perfect measure. And here in the Psalm, Psalm 37, David, King David, he, he knows the reality of that envy. And so he's saying, don't fret, don't fret because of evil people. Don't be envious of those who do wrong. Don't burn with envy. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong. So David's recognizing a, a reality of that envy, a, a burning desire for, for the rewards of, of greed and power, ruthless ambition, self-gratification envy that's caused and continues to cause the destruction of so many people. We read many examples in scripture of such destruction. Lot's wife, for example, remember when Lot and his family were leaving Sodom and Lot's wife looked back with longing at the city, that desperately evil city that she and the family were leaving and were told that God sent judgment upon Lot's wife for her looking back with envy and what she that she perceived to be lacking in her life. They were told that, that she was turned into a pillar of salt. Jesus has, has so much to say in this whole matter of not burning with envy, of not being jealous of the wickedness of life, that jealousy that leads to, to a desire to have things that have no place in a Christian's heart. You read in Luke chapter 17, when Jesus speaks of the future time, when he speaks of his return. And Jesus will come as judge. Jesus speaking of the eternal consequences of, of those who, who look back with, with envy to the delights of the world when, when Jesus returns. And Jesus speaking of that eternal separation between those who put their trust in him and those who've lived a, a selfish desire. As he says, such as in the days of Noah and Lot. And Jesus speaking of condemnation of those who would turn back, preferring the world to Christ. And Jesus giving that start warning in just a few words, Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. And that's, for, that's a warning for all who, who love the world, who love a world that's in rebellion against God. So why do we envy those whose, whose hearts are are in the world rather than in the Lord Jesus. I mean, the, the joys and the delights of a, of a self-centered worldview, these joys are temporary. They're fleeting. They're passing. I think even this very lockdown has, has shown us that the, the so-called pleasures of the world are fleeting. They're not of, of the essence of true living before God. 
And so David's telling us here of those whose hearts are steeped in, in a rebellious world. He tells us in verse 2, For like the grass, they'll soon wither. Like green plants, they'll soon die away. And the pleasures of the world, they are just that, that blink of an eye. They may look new and fresh as fresh grass on a summer's day, a day like today. But that same grass will wither, it will die. Just as those who, who have no, got, got no love for God will pass away without hope, without that true eternal satisfaction of, of security, eternal security for their souls. You're to love God, to have no other gods before God. It's for you, it's for me, for each one of us to seek him first. And in that seeking, to have that desire of heart, that desire not for the pleasures of the world, not for the idols that so drag us away from God, but to have that true desire to know God, to follow him and to serve him for all our days. And it's here, what, as David outlines here in the psalm, how, how that true desire is fulfilled. And by, as David shows us here, through abiding by God's word and God's, God's commands. These, we might say, these building blocks of life that, uh, that help us to live a, life, well, a life, life lived well to the glory of God. And we're going to look at some of these commands this evening. These commands that really concern your day-to-day -day relationship with the one true God. These commands, as we notice, trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord and be still before God. In other words, to have that total change, that total change of direction in your life that focuses your life away from the wicked and away from evildoers and a life lived towards God and his glory. So let's look at these commands. Trust in the Lord and delight in the Lord, as you see in verses 3 and 4. This is the antidote to burning with, with envy towards those whose, whose lives are really, lives live beyond the glorification of God. This antidote to burning with envy is to trust in God and to delight in the Lord. It's to live for him with all, with all your soul and strength and mind. To live in reliance upon him and dependence upon him for all things. And that's what David's doing here in verses 3 and 4. He's redirecting your heart to God with this command to trust in him and with the command to delight in him. Just think, just briefly, with regard to these commands, to trust. In other words, to have that full dependence on God for all things. That relying on God, the Lord who provides, God who rules, God who gives, God who's Promises are utterly trustworthy. That trust, that faith in God for all things. That faith in the one who has promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. Trusting in him who promises you life everlasting. Promises you that security in him for all eternity. And for you who know him as, as, as Lord, for you who are in Christ by faith, you Remember, you've trusted in him with your life. You've trusted in him for your salvation. You've trusted your very soul for all eternity. Well, trust him even now in this life, in the life that he gives you, the sign of eternity. Trust in him, as Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1.3, in, in that relation to that trust. Trust for all that we need for life and godliness. And the heart, the person that, that trusts in the Lord for life and godliness, she won't envy the wicked. She won't be jealous of anything or anyone who's, whose trust is in themselves or their possessions, their power, their particular status. Because the heart, the person that trusts in the Lord, that person's heart is, is directed to God, to the one who provides all things. One who's content in every circumstance. So keep trusting in God. Keep trusting in the one who, 
who promises you and provides for you all that you need for life and for godliness. And have that, that delight to, to express in your heart as David expressed in another psalm. That, that delight to know that your cup truly runs over with the goodness that God gives you. You know that that salvation that you, you know in Christ is full and abiding and overflowing. So be content then in, in Christ. Trust in him. And to know that, that, that a life lived well in faith and trust is a life lived well for the glory of God. And we see it further in, in that verse 3 that, that relates to this whole aspect of contentment. Living a life that's, that's righteous, righteous living. Knowing that contentment and enjoying all the blessing that God gives you. That God showers upon you. That God gives you so that you might enjoy him now and forever. And these wonderful words that we read in verse 3 really think captures this whole aspect of living well to the glory of God. These two simple words, and yet words that contain so much meaning, so much relevance. These words that tell us to befriend faithfulness. Befriend faithfulness. Well, think of what David's telling us here. When you think of friendship in relation to the word befriending, friendship. Friendship suggests a relationship, a relationship of trust a friend whom you, you know whom you love, a friend in whose company you delight. And that, that tending of a relationship, that nurturing a, a relationship is based on trust. You befriend faithfulness and then that indicates a faithfulness to the one who, whom you, you're friends with. And of course, we, we know that ultimately in, in, in the marriage context, the faithfulness of one spouse to another, the, the, the friendship that you nurture, that you engender that through faithfulness. And if we think of that befriending faithfulness then, then think of that in relation to God. Think of your walk with God, a faithful walk with the Lord. Delighting to have that relationship with God. Delighting to be faithful to Him. Delighting to be so faithful to him that you're not going to wander down into various paths, byways that, that have no place in the life of the believer. And that's confirmed in the words that we, we read in the, in, in the Apostle James, James's epistle. <coughs> and he tells us, chapter 4, verse 4, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So the question has to be asked, of whom or of what? Are you friends? Is it friendship that the world of the world that counts most in your life? Or is it friendship with God? Is it that friendship that, that is, is, is shown in your faithfulness to the one true God? Is your faithfulness to God that fulfillment of the chief purpose, the chief end of your life to glorify God and to enjoy him forever? Or is it simply friendship with the world and all its transient, all its passing pleasures that really have no value at all? Because where your ultimate enjoyment lies indicates where your heart's desire is, where your delights truly, truly lie. See, the person who, who enjoys friendship with the world will have no friendship with God. But the person who befriends faithfulness serves God and delights in that relationship that he has, that she has with God. He'll find, she'll find that her true fulfillment in life is to honor God, to glorify him, and to find true pleasure in that relationship that she knows that he knows in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... David tells us here in verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You might ask, well, what does it mean to delight in the Lord? Well, surely it means this. It means that striving to know God. So striving to know him more and more through, through knowing him through his word, through the Bible. 
that delighting in God means following the Lord Jesus, serving him, being his disciple, as you love him, as you grow in, 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 in the grace of the Lord Jesus, as you grow in that knowledge of God, delighting in knowing God, delighting in obeying God, delighting to go where God sends you, delighting to do his will, to do whatever God asks you to do. And delighting in God that, that thrills your heart every time you hear the name of the Lord Jesus, your Savior. That delighting to commune with God, even in your, your time of prayer. And delighting to know true fellowship with the one who's called you to himself. And we have to say this as well, that really captures this whole aspect of delighting in God. Delighting in God involves delighting in what God delights in. Well, what does God delight in? God the Father delights in God the Son. Remember at the baptism of Jesus when the Father called out that this is my Son in whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And I might say this too. What else does God delight in? Well, God delights in his church. In Psalm 45, verse 11, we read these words. Well, we read of God delighting in, in, in the beauty of, of the bride of Christ, the delighting in the church. And ask again yourself, is the Lord Jesus the object of your delight? Is, is the church itself, the church, the church of the Lord Jesus, is the church your delight? Is it your delight so much so that you love the Lord's people, that you love to be in fellowship one with another? I think that really has to be a test of your delighting in, in God, that you delight in the Lord Jesus and you delight in the blessing of the fellowship that you have one with another in Christ. So that delighting in God, that delighting in his word, that delighting in Christ, delighting with the Lord's people and in the Lord's people, well, that delight involves desire, true desire, simplest desire, what you desire with all your heart. That delighting God is going to lead to your heart desiring to honor him, to please him, to serve him, to, to delight in his presence, to delight in his in, his, in, in, in fellowship with God, to, to enjoy his presence and, and, and to Anticipate, the delight of anticipating that joy with him in the glory of heaven. These, de these delights aren't for selfish gain. They're not for any kind of pleasure principle, the sort of instant gratification that, that Freud spoke of. No, the true desire, true delight comes from a heart that truly rejoices in God and truly desires to do God's will, that truly desires to, to serve him. Because he is God, he's Lord, he's, he's your saviour. He is the Almighty. And your delight, surely, to delight in him, to desire him, and to desire that others know him as Lord and saviour. And that delighting, and those who delight in God, those who desire God, are those who are humble in heart. Later in, in verse 11 of, of, the, of Psalm 37, we read these words, the words that Jesus echoed in the Sermon on the Mount. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Meek, those who, as Jesus says, will inherit the earth, those whose ultimate inheritance as the saints of God, that ultimate inheritance is in the new heavens and the new earth. You who are in Christ will have and know that eternal joy. and You'll reign with them. You who are meek, humble, you who serve him with all your heart. You have that promise of the possession, even now, of the peace of God that passes all understanding. That peace that you have with now and will know in all eternity. And the more that you delight in God, the more that your heart's desire is focused on him and, and, and loving God and loving your neighbor, the more you'll I have that desire to seek first the, the kingdom of God, just as Jesus commanded us to do. Again, that surely has to be the desire of your heart. Desire not, not for, for riches, 
not for fame, not for power, but to seek first the kingdom of God, to seek that his kingdoms advance, even in our land, even in the world. To show your love for him who first loved you. And in your relationship with God, the one in whom you trust, in whom you delight in, in whom you rely on totally, in whom you depend upon wholly, then yes, you will face troubles, you will face hardships, you will face difficulties, you will face dangers. But again, we're given that assurance even here in the psalm, that when these times do happen, to cast your care, your cares on the Lord, as you see in verse 5 and verse 6 to commit your way to the Lord. And the wording here in the psalm is literally to, to roll your cares in the Lord, like a big, a big boulder to roll that, that heavy stone on, on, on the Lord. It's something that's been concerning you, something so demanding. Uh, as Peter said again in, uh, in one of his letters, to cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So that when you do go through the waters of adversity, when you do pass through the flames of, of suffering, well, you'll know, you know, that you have a Lord who's with you even through these times of difficulty. You know that you have the Lord before you so that you can roll upon him that burden, the, the burdens of care, the burdens that you have even, even in your heart. And you can roll them upon God whose arms are waiting to take that burden. Yes, whose shoulders can bear that burden because he's the Lord Almighty whose love for you is rooted in all eternity. Roll your cares on the Lord. Commit to him these cares, these concerns of your heart because even that very committing to God, your cares is an act of trust, trusting in the Lord, knowing that he's able, yes, willing to deal gently with you, even as you cast your cares on the Lord. And as you read in verse 6 of the psalm here, the result of that rolling onto God, that, that weight, that burden of our concerns, actually the consequence will be a blessing from God, God blessing the one who trusts in him. And so if your burden, your care is, is such that it concerns your own soul, your own self, if your burden is such even that concerns the very progress of the, the gospel in the land, then commit to him that care, that concern. Call upon him in prayer and know that the heart rejoices when you do cast your cares on the Lord because he's promised to sustain you and answer according to his perfect goodness, his perfect righteousness. So we have these promises of God, these promises that God gives us in this, in this psalm. And so what's our response to all that we've seen so far? Well, surely the response is to be again a command, a command to follow, verse 7, to be still before God, to be silent before God. As we were hearing this morning, there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. And so often I think we forget that time to be silent, before God, to wait upon God, to hear him speak to us through his word, to hear his voice speak to you, to comfort you, to encourage you, to draw you to himself, to bring you back to himself as you live and seek to live in, in trust and in faithfulness to him. So be still before God. Even in your anxious heart, wait upon God. Be silent before him. When you are still before God, silent before God, yes, seek to, to hear his voice, seek to open your, your ears to that voice, and yes, to meditate upon all that he's given to you in his promises of his faithfulness towards you. And remember, he delights in you. We're thinking of delighting in God. Remember, God delights in all who are his. As you're silent before God, hear him speak to you of that greatness of God's love towards you. He delights in you. His desire is for your, your salvation, for your sanctification, 
for your being with him for all eternity. And so thank him for his grace. Thank him for his mercy. Praise him for that peace that you enjoy with him, that abundant peace that, yes, truly passes all understanding. And yes, put your trust in him today and live as one who truly does befriend faithfulness to the glory of his name. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, teach us, we pray, how we should and must befriend faithfulness, how we seek to live for you, to know that friend that is closer than a brother, and to be faithful in all that we are and all that we do in serving you. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray truly that we will abide by your commands, to follow your commands as to how we must love you and our neighbour as ourselves. Teach us, Lord. Help us. Maybe not simply hear and then forget your word, but teach us, Lord, how we might retain your word and apply it in our lives. Continue with us now, Lord, we pray. We ask these things in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to sing part of Psalm 37 now, not um, words that we read, but certainly words that we're going to sing from that uh, psalm, uh, words from verse 23 to 27. A good man's footsteps by the Lord are ordered aright, and in the way wherein he walks, he greatly doth delight. 23 to 27, Psalm 37, God's in prayer. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>